everyone, and welcome to the Dao Yi Roundtable Talk series. I'm Robert Coons. Today, I'm very excited to introduce an interview I did recently with Qigong expert Fabrice Pichet, who is part of the Taiji Shibasher lineage of Qigong, coming from Lin Hoxiang, and also Mark Wiley, the owner and head publisher at Tambuli Media Group. We covered a wide range of Qigong-related topics, which was a, a great joy, and it was very pleasurable to inter interview them both. We especially talked about contemporary issues facing the Qigong scene and the Qigong industry, uh, as well as pitfalls for beginners, intermediate students, and teachers alike. So I hope that you'll enjoy this interview and find it beneficial. And if you have any thoughts, please leave a comment in the comments section, as well as, of course, remembering to subscribe to the Dowi channel and giving us a like if you like the video. Thank you very much for watching, and uh, I again, I hope you enjoy the interview. With me today uh, is the inimitable Fabrice Pichet and the extraordinary Mark Wiley, um, two friends from the Qigong and martial arts and self-cultivation world who uh, are extraordinarily extraordinary people on their own. But today you get to enjoy them as a tag team and uh, they are going to use their martial arts to uh, defeat me. <laughs> um, but in all reality, actually, we're going to have a cool um, three-way conversation about Qigong in three tenses, uh, pre present, past, and future. Um, and so basically, this is going to be a somewhat free conversation, but we're going to basically talk about, from our perception, um, where Qigong came from in the context of North America and perhaps the Occident more generally. Um, where we're at right now, what's the zeitgeist of Qigong, and where we are going um, in the future, both in a in the sense of where we would like to go and perhaps where we might not like to go. Um, so I think that uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll start by asking a question, and then we'll we'll probably be able to sort of pick it up from there. Um, I want to ask you both how you got your introduction to Qigong, and I'm the way that I'd like to make the the movement of the question go right now fabrice is next to me on my screen and mark is under me so let's start with fabrice and then we'll we'll go to mark sounds good um so i got my introduction to qigong when i started studying chinese medicine uh back in 1997 uh the school i studied at in montreal had uh, a strong base in in qigong as a tool to develop the therapist for the massage uh, and, and acupressure methodology of treatment that we were doing. So that's how I kind of got uh, introduced to Qigong. Um, my teacher, Francesco Francois Caron, um, was at the time teaching the Soaring Crane Qigong, which I believe, Rob, you're familiar with, um, and focusing quite a bit also on the spontaneous Qigong uh, as a more advanced practice with it. Um, we were doing a bit of the Shaolin Zanzuan as far as a, a posture to build Qi, although at the time I didn't quite understood that system as much as after when I met Professor Lin, since it's part also of his background. Um, Professor Lin Hosheng was my main teacher right now uh, for the better part of the last 12, 13 years. Um, but yeah, my introduction was studying Chinese medicine with the uh, San Suan. And then in Montreal, studying with different teacher, learning different approach, looking um, for a few system until I finally met Professor Lin in 2013 and uh, focus mostly on his system, the Tai Chi Qigong Shabasha. Brilliant. You see what I have right in front of me is um, Fabrice very kindly sent me this this edition of uh, Professor Lin's book, which um, is is the ori original. And uh, it's it's a very, very good book. It's sitting actually right on my desk right next to where I film along with along with this, um, this compendium of Taoist alchemy and uh, this brick of tea. Mm. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> have you had a chance to uh, have a bit of a look at the book 
I have, I have, and I'd like to, I'd like to to pass some comments on it, but I need to have, uh, I need to, you know, have a bit of time to to go into it more deeply. Um, it's, I, I really like period Qigong books. I, I think they're very interesting. And and Mark and I have something to say about that too, perhaps a little later. But could you introduce us to to your Qigong background, Mark? Sure. Um, I started martial arts in 1979 and loved watching the Shaw Brothers movies on television that came on on the weekends. And there was uh, invariably some qi or qigong or healing stuff going on. Um, and in about 1986, a qigong master named Ho Fa Shang came from Xi'an to Philadelphia to help a family of uh, people who got injured. And um, he connected with a group there and started teaching qigong. Um, I went to him because I saw the advertisement and um, for the next 12 years kind of apprenticed with him in his family style method. I think I sent you a copy of our tiny books a, a while ago that we did. Um, and then in early 90s, when I started training in the Philippines, my Kung Fu teacher, Alex Ko, uh, who has since passed on, uh, in addition to our five ants, the Sester Fist style taught me the Baduan Jin. And then my David Chan, another Sifu who passed away, taught me the Shinyi uh, Janjuang. Uh, and then I moved to Japan and learned started learning Tai Chi with uh, Jibiki Buho, who was a student of Wang Fu Lai and did their Janjuang as well and some Tai Chi. And that was kind of the beginning from 86 to like 96, the first 10 years, I guess. Exceptional. And, and actually, I have Master Ho's book on my coffee table in the living room. And I, I, when I'm sitting on the couch, the good coaster, I, you know. I pick through. Well, I, I pick through it, you know. So it's, it's you. Both of you have kindly sent me books. I, I am, I am always very appreciative when people do that. Incidentally, audience members, if you happen to have excellent books, uh, I am a officially registered book eater. So uh, I will eat your books. Um, it's. Uh, do anybody remember the Monty Python routine where they've got the kid eating art? at the Louvre and then uh, the, the mother says, yeah, stop that. And she takes a bite of the painting and she says, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like. <laughs> anyway, um, so, okay, good. So we've got your backgrounds uh, a little bit anyway, because everybody has very, you know, rich and, and complex histories. Um, and, and my background, just for the record, um, I, uh, I I got I did martial arts as a kid, and then I got it kind of banged up as a teenager because of uh, some bad life choices, and so I discovered qigong as a way to sort of rehabilitate myself after a mental health crisis, and it worked. Uh, but <laughs> I'm still kind of crazy, but um. So anyway, this is this is good, and we've all been practicing qigong for a reasonably long period of time. It's it's a very very interesting study because it's it's multifaceted. There's a lot of stuff going on there. And um, before we get into sort of our impressions of the, the past of Qigong, I just want to take a moment to mention that we have a kind of interesting, um, let's say, collection of Qigong ideas here, because um, Fabrice is, is doing Qigong, which is deeply steeped in the medical tradition, but I believe also Professor Lin has um, also sports background too, and uh, and and Mark, um, you're uh, you're really like a, a consummate martial artist, and I don't be humble because I've heard stories uh, about you from from Corey, and he says that he says that um, you you should be hit by Mark, but you shouldn't be hit by Mark because yeah. it's a lesson, but it's not a very fun lesson. <laughs> so Sorry, given mm. given that, I was wondering, you know. If I can get your impressions of, let's say the sort of the telos of, of qigong, the 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 um, where we're trying to go with it, and it doesn't have to be. If you if you want to talk about something, if I pigeonholed you, then feel free to you know talk about something outside of um, medicine or outside of martial arts. But can we start with you, Mark, and 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 sure. try to find out what qigong is for? What is it for? Okay. Um, as well as for plenty of things, um, you know, when, when, uh, Fa Shang Ho was here teaching and, and he's still here, he's in New Jersey, but his path is medical Qigong, you know, he's not a martial artist, um, but it's medical Qigong. I suffered from my whole life in chronic pain and chronic migraine headaches 
And part of the reason I was training with him was to get treatments and to learn his method and carry on with him. Um, but as things go, you know. Um, but so my first intro there was for medical reasons. You know, my father was a physician. My mother was a psychologist, all kinds of testing and blood work and scans and medicines. And I was just getting sicker and sicker and more and more pain and rebound headaches and rebound pain from the stuff. And that's why I was like, I think the answer is going to be in this mystical stuff. You know, I was a teenager. I was in high school and um, felt better. And basically my dad would say, it's just because he's making you breathe more and you have more oxygen. And I said, well, that should be there before the medicine comes in. You know, like why, why didn't my primary care tell me that? Um, but I think, you know, primarily it is very excellent. It is quite excellent as a means of both, you know, finding your center, relaxing the mind, taking stress and anxiety out, feeling an internal and external um, unison or connection to kind of feel whole, right? Uh, and, and to develop. And it's got quite a bit of health benefits. And for the ones who want it for the martial arts or the sporting benefits, that's there as well. Um, and the techniques, just I know a lot of people along the way that I have met and interacted with thought that if you just do chi ball or, you know, pressing the heavens or whatever, that you're going to have martial arts skills or you can also heal somebody. And, you know, they're different sets of exercises. It's not all one thing. You're like you learn qigong and you can withstand blows and you can heal people and you can fix your frozen shoulder. There's different schools of qigong and different methods for qigong. And, and I think that's a great thing about it. It has so many applications, but to really be good or really gain the benefits, you need to kind of dive into the one that you need the most first or want the most first. Brilliant. I, I like the answer. So, and how about you, Fabrice? What te teleologically speaking, what's what's the deal? Well, I think it's uh, as Mark pointed out. It's very much a question of what do you want to do with it. How do you want to use it? Um, if we go back to the the etiology of qigong, it, gong is developing the skill over a period of time of qi. What do you want to do with your qi? How are you using it in your body? Which And qi, if we take it at the broader perspective that incorporate jing, can incorporate level of shen through the bigger uh, perspective of it. Um, and in a sense, uh, Professor Lin considered qi an information carrier element. So what kind of information do you want your qi to carry through your body as you're doing things and the benefits that it can bring to you? So... It's, it's very much a question of how you train it. And some of the, the early research in the 70s that Professor Lin participated in were very interesting because the type of training that the different master that they tested were doing had a different kind of emission that was from the body that they could measure. Uh, the type of training that Professor Lin did specifically for qi emission was more in the low infrared uh, frequency which through the research that they did seemed to be the most efficient layer for healing purposes. But in the video that's uh, on, on YouTube that you can see, you can see one of the Shaolin external martial uh, Qigong guy, which does a very impressive demonstration. He has this fairly thick metal bar that he takes and slap on his rib a couple of times. And there you see how the bar kind of bend. Then he plays the bar on the ground and kind of jump on it. So you can see that it doesn't bend that easily, even though he put his weight and the guy, you know, it's fairly thick. But then he flips it around and smack it on his head twice and the bar becomes almost straight again. Um, and when they measured the emission that he was doing from Bai Hui, it was this electromagnetic peak that the moment that it would emit the chi, the machine would record it, but then there was nothing in between. And then mm -hmm. when it would go, huh, and then you would see that peak that was coming out. So his training was that more of the electromagnetic, which in a sense, if you think about a magnet, it kind of binds things together, make it tighter, and, and maybe even create a little bit more of that buffer that made it so that the impact didn't bother him as much. Um, and so we can see that his training was based on that. And there was another guy who had more of a static electricity that was, you know, manipulating a sensor based for static electricity at a, a certain distance. Uh, whereas Professor Lin for the infrared, from the moment he started emitting to about a minute later when he stopped, 
there was, you know, the line was flat and then he started emitting and the infrared sensor picked it up and then it stopped again. So the kind of training that you do with Qigong will build different kind of reaction in your body based on your, your intent and your interest uh, while you're training it. So it's very, very interesting for that. So what I'm taking away from both of you, in fact, is that there could be multiple purposes for Qigong. And uh, I, I apologize if it's a little bit coy, but I'm not going to say what I think the telos of Qigong is, because it will give me more opportunities to to sow seeds of chaos later on. So um, that that's good. So now let's let's get into the the meat of things. Now that we've sort of given our our backstories a little bit, and we've talked a little bit about um, kind of the general goals of Qigong. So we can talk about the history of Qigong in in China in a modern context, but I think that um, it, it may be useful first to to sort of talk about it in the in the North American context, especially. Uh, I don't know how much you guys know about Qigong in Europe. I don't really know too much, um, but if you do, then of course, welcome to 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 uh, put put in your your two cents. But when we think about the development of Qigong in in North America, um, my impression is like the first published books that I've seen would have been like nineteen eighties, probably early early to mid eighties, and I have one at home. It's very interesting. It's called, uh, I think it's called like um, Qi Kung, right? C H I K U N J, and it says it said like something like Chinese longevity practices for for improved life or something like that, and it's basically like um, a book full of illustrations of some very pretty simple stretching. And uh, but I don't actually know that much about the genesis of, of Qigong in North America. And and uh, I, I would like to actually ask you specifically, Mark, because I think that you have um, you because of your history publishing, you have this wonderful sort of ear to the ground that, that you've developed over a long period of time where you're pretty aware of the scene. And so uh, I wonder if I can I can ask um What's the what was your first, let's say, exposure uh, to Qigong as it came to North America? Not not withholding your introduction to your teacher. Not yeah, I I've that. been a a big collector of martial arts books uh, and and magazines back in the day, but I mean you can see a bookshelf behind me. That's maybe thirty percent of the collection. There's another set in the front and another cabinet and whatever. So um, I've been following the book publishing and and I've worked for several publishers. So I think the Chi Kung book that you're talking about with the stretching, is that have like uh, a pink font, pink colored titles on the front of the book or red? I thought it was, uh, it might've been black and red wrong. and it's got a lady wearing a kind of like an, oh, like 1980s. A leotard. Of, like, like something like that, yeah. Yeah, I think Tuttle Publishing, my former employer um, from the 90s, published that one. Um, yeah. And um, just like the old yoga books, they were in like one piece leotard, uh, you know, when they presented over here. Um, that was one of the first ones. And of course, I was going into Chinatowns, into the little shops and looking for the little Chinese books, because that's where all the secrets were, mm -hmm. of course, out in public for people to buy. Uh I couldn't read any of it, but they had the nice line drawings and I would just, you know, try and figure out what they were talking about. Um, the first major book came out was Yang Jing Ming's that people paid attention to the roots of Chinese Qigong. And then he came out with the, um, uh, well, he had a white crane Qigong book, white crane power. And then he had one on the, um, on the um, uh, Yi Jin Jing muscle change and Ten, muscle tendon change classic, you know, and those were big back in the day. And, and Mantak Chia started publishing Qigong books, Iron Shirt, Qigong 1 and 2, uh, Meditation, Fusion of Five Elements, uh, Khan and Lee, et cetera, et cetera. And he was just pounding those books out starting in the 80s as well into the 90s. Um, so those are really the, the main sources. And there were some other publishers. I think Dover Press came out with some. And I have a, a couple of Japanese um, from Kodansha and J J uh, Japan Press, who came out with some Qigong books um, with photos and drawings. And the Ni family, Ni Hua Jing, came out with a book on um, 
he didn't call it qigong it was um it was um uh, something similar i'm i'm losing my brain for a moment having a a senior moment but but uh anyway and so there was a pretty popular that, and you, and we would see like the five animal frolics and eight brocades six healing sounds started coming out a little bit later uh the standing post a ton of da cheng chuan and each one books uh, that were in English and Chinese that have come out around that time and into the 90s when it started getting a little bigger. Paul Dong came out with a few books. Um, so I, I, I can't say what were the first, or but my recollections are that Yang Jing Ming came out with the first big ones and Mantak Chia followed up in suit with many, 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 um, where Yang Jing Ming was kind of doing Kung Fu and other things in his publishing. Mantak really, really focused on that. Yeah, you know, it's it's the man, the first Yang Jing Ming book that was really famous, the for Qigong, the um the roots of Chinese Qigong, that was in our in our Taiji classes when I started doing Taiji in the early two thousands. Yeah. That was like it was the Bible of Qigong, you know, yeah. because it had it had so much variety in it. It was an incredible. It still is an incredible book just based on the sheer amount of variety, because there's not that many sort of overviews of Qigong in the English language. Usually, right. like you know, one system or or the other, um, and they're quite focused in one area, but that one really is is pretty impressive. So, well, let me put the question to you, Fabrice, and and by the way, so now you can feel free to like jump in and jump out as, as you like um, uh, when when you get ideas, but so, so Fabrice, for you, um, when, when you were first looking at, at Qigong books, I think you might have been practicing a little longer than I have. I've been practicing since 2000 and uh 2001 um but uh when when you got started out um what was uh what were the really like seminal qigong books or qigong media that that attracted you the most at that time there wasn't that much uh that i was aware of partially because my english at the time was also somewhat limited so i would look into french translation some of the stuff that was coming from France, there was a little bit. Uh, Gerard Ed had quite a few, which has quite a few interesting stuff, more into Taoism and meditation as well. Um, there were a few other that came out more in the early 2000. Uh, Yves Rekena, which was one that published quite a few books. Um, the main book that I was looking into were more related to the Qigong system I was studying. Uh, because they were available in French. Uh, Bruce Francis, his big book on internal martial arts was one of the, the one that I kind of got interested in a little bit. And some of his video that I was able to see at the time were kind of those that got me very interested in Bagua and, and some other stuff. Although I never studied with them directly. Um, yeah. When did your teacher come to come to North America? Lin Hosheng? Yeah. Um, I think he moved to the LA area in the early 2000s when he took his retirement from the Shanghai Qigong Research Institute. Uh, his daughter was living in the US, so he kind of started to move back and forth. And now he's more more permanently uh, in the US. Or I think around 2010, he got his uh, residency. So he decided to stay there more officially. Yeah. It's a nice, quiet place to to retire, I'm sure. Um, okay, so given that we've we've sort of you know we've sort of established a bit of a route historically, I you know I always get the impression that like the probably this is just a guess by the way, but probably the origins of of Chinese energy work in the outside of the diaspora, right? Because the diaspora that's a whole other story, and and probably probably if we're doing our due diligence, we'll, we'll get some, some old school diaspora members on, on the show at some point, but within the, within the non-diaspora population, I have to sort of guess that the early energy work stuff probably would have largely come over with martial artists who were training in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And that I think is, um, and, and, you know, the thing about it though, is that like, there's this whole um, environment of Qigong that isn't Qigong, if if that makes sense, where it, it is, but but it's like practices that are attached to traditional martial arts, which predate the 
the modern usage of the word Qigong, which, by the way, I think Fabrice is really qualified to talk about. So I want to come back to that in a minute. But um, it, it occurs to me that in um, southern Chinese martial arts lineages and also northern lineages out of Taiwan, there was a lot of um, like, quote unquote, Taoist practice or Buddhist practice infused in the martial arts. And I wanted to ask you, Mark, because you have this amazing background in Southern Chinese martial arts. Um, and I know that like the Southern martial arts have specialized breathing practices and specialized intention practices and stuff like that. And I want to ask, like, as you were growing up in, in Southern Chinese martial arts, what your impression of the sort of like energetic or spiritual aspect of them was and, and how you feel about that today? Hmm. Um, well, yes, you're, you're correct that a lot of the, so a lot of the stuff from the healing and meditative, uh, and Qigong practices of, of South China, for example, kind of lodged in with the Kung Fu scene, right? The martial artists. So all the, uh, the, the bone setting, the, the Dita Jiao, the liniments, the herbal, the scraping, the cupping, you know, the massage work. If you need any of that, you see the, the Kung Fu guy. Um, so those guys brought it over here. The Long Ying guys had it, you know, the five ancestor fist guys have it. A lot of, a lot of different Hungar guys have it. A lot of those different Southern fist guys have it. And, and it, so it was in their books, right? So the Juklum, um, uh, um, uh, and Chow Gar, you know, um, in Hong Kong, in the U S uh, have it or had it at some point. And, um, but you weren't, you're getting kind of a basic Qigong routine, with kind of a Wai Gong or external training method. So the, you know, pounding, pounding yourselves with the bamboo and lifting the iron lock weights and, you know, banging arms and uh, that kind of this kind of external training uh, in the Gol Chokun or we call Wu Zhu Chuan. You have a lot of intra-abdominal pressure uh, with the breathing, uh, breathing out only a certain percent of breath with each move and holding breath in uh, not holding your breath, but not releasing all of the breath. And we have the San Chen form with the Sanjan in Mandarin, where you're um, practicing this kind of back and forth between tension and relaxation to kind of pack the energy and let the energy release and pack the energy and let the energy release. And most of that was for martial, for martial arts ends, right? For emitting power when punching or pushing and striking and be able to take the hits, be able to hold a deep root. That's why we do the standing post, you know, uh, um, but you weren't getting a lot of health benefits from it otherwise, like, you know, better blood circulation or, you know, good work for the heart, <laughs> for the kidney, for the liver. It wasn't, the focus wasn't on that. Um, so I think I'm kind of missing out in the health, the medical Qigong, it's more in what they call the martial or, or sports, you know, Qigong, Qigong practices there. The spiritual stuff, I think for the martial artist. It's it's up and down. There's some, you know, there's a there's a dragon teacher, Long Ying, Long Ying Hyun master in, in Philadelphia. He's an herbalist, a Ditta master, and he's very inclined towards, you know, meditation and um feng shui. And he doesn't doesn't talk about it much, but he meditates all the time. All the Tai Chi guys are doing some kind of standing meditation. They're Tai Chi Qigong, but not many are spiritual. I find uh, in my realm, in, in my circles. Um, so I'm not sure where uh, my, my Kung Fu teacher was Catholic, even, you know, born and raised in Chinese, second generation born and raised in the Philippines in Chinatown. And his family was Catholic because the Philippines is 80% Catholic. So they were raised Catholic, even though in the Guun, they have a Buddhist altar, but almost all the guys were, were Catholic. It's kind of interesting where down the line they opened the one in the late 1800s so where did this the change come probably you know sometime near world war ii or something um not sure but um i don't find a lot of the the southern fist chinese guys doing meditation so much as the northern guys might do you know unless they all they happen to be buddhist or taoist aside from being a kung fu guy that they would involve in that yeah I've uh, I've heard I've heard stories, but I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about them, um, about some of the southern guys and the and and the organizations and ritual magic. But I think I'll just leave well, it. Well, yeah. So yeah. okay. So yeah. I mean, you have the triads, right? And yeah, Tian Di Joe and all these guys, um, that that have that kind of thing. 
but that's really within those groups, not within the arts, you know. It's like wide. particular to their organization rather than yeah. Their, yeah, yeah, that yeah, makes it's sense. More toward the Tong or the their their triad group. Yeah. There's some like overlap rather than it being directly causal. Mm -hmm. And even the the dragon master I'm talking about is president of Hung Moon, uh, of one of the branches, and he won't talk to me about all their secret stuff. He's like, you don't, you're not in the group. I can't talk to you about it. We have secret hand signals and secret this and secret that. And I'm like, yeah, I got like six books on it. Like, can you, can you verify, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah. But we can establish our own secret hand signals. That's right. Anyway, <laughs> right, uh, there it is. Wait, you know the signal. <laughs> uh, there we go. The, the, the bookshelf wall opens and uh, yeah. inside yeah. is all of the numinous treasure. Um. Okay, so now I, I did mention that we were going to come back briefly to this idea of sort of the what we might say modern qigong and then pre-modern qigong. These are these are strange categories that are murky and and uh, and I'm very interested in them by the way because I like strange murky things. Um, but but I've had a lot of private conversations with with you, Fabrice, actually about this subject because I think both of us feel a little bit of um, mild frustration at the way that the that people represent and misrepresent sometimes the word qigong. And I think in order to understand our, our present day and also North American or Occidental historical relationship with qigong, we need to briefly touch on this concept of like how qigong got its name. And then beyond that, what the what the current state of the controversy is surrounding it. So I, I think I've said enough for you to pick it up. Do you want to take it away? Sure. Um, so for viewers who may not be familiar so much with the history, what we call Qigong nowadays, really the word itself really come from the mid fifties, roughly mid to late fifties. Um, there, there's a few historical trace of the word being used in some treaty, but it's, it, probably didn't have the kind of meaning that we we give it today. Although, and because it became kind of this umbrella term that regroup all of the practice, or at least that was the idea in the 50s, where all of the physical breathing meditative kind of practice would fit under this newer umbrella of Qigong, um, that kind of became where it's from. And as it it grew at first, there was a lot more breathing related and it was actually the word Qigong was a lot more used for health aspects. So the really the root of it is almost medical Qigong with the four sanatorium. Um, not really good with name, but I'm sure Robert, you, the, the first guy who built the sanatorium. Um, was it Liu Gui Zhen? Yes, the Neyangong guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, who was kind of the first one who, who brought the concept uh, a little bit more, and then the sanatorium and the during the seventies, mid sixties, seventies, during the Cultural Revolution, it kind of went mute a little bit more, and then the mid seventies, after the death of Mao Zedong, it kind of came back onto the surface, um, and the the in the term that's used more in the West, I'm not sure, and correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, I'm not sure if the term Qigong fever is that used in China or if it's more Western terminology. Yeah, yeah, they call it, they call it Qigong Rue Shi Dai. So okay. literally uh, Qigong fever period or Qigong yeah. heat period, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so that, that element of the Qigong fever um, was not solely started by Professor Lin, but a lot of the work that he did on the research, the Qigong anesthesia, and, and the book that you showed was actually the first book on Qigong that was uh, published after the Cultural Revolution. So it was kind of the first one authorized to publish a book on that subject. Um, so it, it really regrew. And from there, everybody now did Qigong in different ways. Uh, so all of the different practices became known as Qigong because that was the word that was popular. So everybody did. And unfortunately, within that big popularity, the fraudulent people who wanted to have, you know, magical powers also kind of jumped on the bandwagon and, and did some stuff that shouldn't have been done <laughs> all, all the way culminating to the incident with the Falun Gong and the Chinese government cracking down again on the idea of Qigong and until they, they closed up the door for pretty much 
all of the Qigong Institute except two, as far as I know, uh, the uh, Bedaihe, the one from the Neyangong, and the one, the Shanghai Qigong Institute, because of the work of Professor Lin, which was closely related to treating some of the head of states um, at the time. And because of his approach to Qigong being very scientific and very down to earth and not trying to become a new god or anything like that, um, made it so that these two main institutes stayed open while pretty much all of the other were officially closed. Um, or at least for those that were official Qigong sanatorium within the recognition from the government. And then they rebranded the Health Qigong Association, which became much more of a sport and health maintenance, um, which is the main form of Qigong that we see coming out of China now. And because it is pushed by the government publicity machine, it's the one that's kind of spreading all over. So um, it's it's kind of taking over with the newer version of the Baduan Jin, the Yi Jin Jin, and, and all of those. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think that until um, until the end of the Qigong fever period, um, Qigong was administrated by the Department of Health. And then in the more recent period, it's administrated by the Department of Sport. And so yes. you see a very, a very big difference in, in the presentation. Um, and it's interesting, too, a lot of the points you brought up are really fascinating to me. One of the things about the, the somewhat less scrupulous people that you mentioned, there's a great story. I can't say who it is, but there's a great story about one of the most famous, famous Qigong guys, that his claim to fame was that he could stick his finger into the blades of a fan, an electric fan, and stop the blade. And so that was the proof that he had the he had the chi in his body, and and uh, and and he became extremely famous as a result. Um, so that's that's a really interesting synopsis, and uh, I think to I'm just gonna um, help try to help fill it out a little bit too to add a little bit more color. Um, in my understanding is that basically there's been three what they say three waves of, of qigong popularity so but um there's another period actually slightly before uh during the before the communist era um in uh in the late 19th and early 20th century where there was a sort of proto qigong and and you see it with texts like um yi jin jing there's about 10 10 different volumes of the yi jin jing that came out and this i think is something that that we can talk to mark about in a minute because mark has specialization there but these different manuals of yi jin jing which originally i think was published in the in the 18th century but um the more more common manuals you see like um um what's it called uh um Anyway, forget it. I can't remember the names, but like there's these various um, pictorial depictions of the Yijin Jing. And they're really interesting because they were the first volumes to systematize a theory by which meditation and moving practices, what we call Daoyin, moving practices could be synthesized into, let's say, a consistent system. So in old Taoist documents or old Chinese medicine documents, you see this um, very big trend toward putting different practices in the same document, but nobody explains it as a system. And it's not until Yi Jin Jing starts coming out that they say, well, you know, you can't only meditate, you have to move too. And this is one of the ways that we've come to our sort of consensus in Qigong today. Like you mentioned, where at the start in the 50s, when they were developing Qigong as a, as a new system, they put together the breathing and the meditation and the movement in one place, whereas before they would have been split into slightly more discrete practices. Um, but that era, um, going up into the 19th century, what you start seeing is, is a scientization of practice. Um, and there's a couple of authors, Jiang Wei Qiao, who wrote a book called Yin Shi Zi, um, Stillness meditation or, or quiet meditation, I think, is its English name. Um, and I mention it because people can can go read it. There's there's a couple English language translations. He was um, he was the first person to write a, a scientific doctrine of of Taoist meditation. And then um, around the same time, another guy named Zhao Bi Chen, whose book is called Xingming Fajui, um, he was doing internal alchemy. But what he did was he started using the nervous system to explain the spirit. And so then by the 50s, once they started doing Qigong science, which is the, you know, the proper name, I think, that people have been using until recently, um, 
they they had this interesting background of people who'd contributed but hadn't hadn't matured the system so i really i think that period of history is is fascinating and going back to it and and reading those books the the the, the early ones and then up into the 50s and into the 80s um it's the best context actually that we have because when we look at um when we look at qigong books now it's like the it's like the tip of the iceberg but then under it's all the stuff that led up to led up to it but so then if we go back you know a bit farther we can talk about neijing uh uh Jing, which which mark has a uh, specialization in and so mark i want to ask you you i want to ask you to talk like um openly about Yijin Jing, so whatever whatever sort of comes to mind but sort of within the parameter of this thing being like this very um, foundational idea in what we call Qigong today, and sort of your impressions of of what what the Yijin Jing is, and maybe what the Shi Sui Jing is, if you if you want to touch on that a bit, because those are very very interesting documents we can learn a lot from. Yeah, sure. Uh, one thing I want to ask you is, so Dao Yin, you're saying was was basically moving practices. Um, the Dao Yin books that I see that I have are like stretching. Uh, things like that. Um, but of course you have to move to stretch, you know, or move and hold. And weren't and maybe Fabrice can answer this too, because uh, I was curious as to what he was saying. Was I mean Dao Yin was part Dao Yin was part of a group of things that were out there before Qigong became the name to kind of encompass them all. Is, is that correct? Yes, exactly. So a lot of the wording that we now see kind of popping back up, Dao Yin, uh Yang Shengong. Uh, health maintenance practice, mm -hmm. um, Neigong, which we hear also quite a lot and yeah. a bit more sometime in the martial aspect. Um, and I would even say to a certain extent, Neidan, um, more meditative practice, uh, as well as probably other. So one aspect that we need to kind of keep in mind, China is a really big country with a lot of different group all over smaller, you know, small dialect, also differences. And so throughout the development of all of these arts, people had an idea and use a certain wording to express what they were doing, which mean that people in that area would call certain exercises a certain way. And then people in another province or further south, the south or the north, which we see also a lot in the martial arts and things like that. So people had different way to talk about things and expressed it and explain their concept a little bit differently. And part of the idea of naming that Qigong was to kind of bring everybody under the same turn to say, hey, we're really kind of saying the same thing. And in the end, with, of course, you know, the moving practice being different than the seated practice, but the concept of moving chi and, and what they're doing was there. And so within the concept at the same time of traditional Chinese medicine, bringing back the notion of the medicine together and solidifying the understanding so that it would be a bit easier to centralize it and spread it afterwards, uh, there was that that idea behind it so by bringing everyone to have a common discussion would make that easier and to what uh, Robbie was saying just earlier the idea of making links also with this western scientific process the western medicine concept anatomy and all of that so that it becomes easier to make those link um, and there, there's still that mentality underground that continue to grow in, in some circle uh, to try to bring the understanding of it. And particularly in, in Chinese medicine and the research they're doing now to try to understand the concept of qi from a more biomedical uh, and the link with gasotransmitter and nitric oxide in particular and, and other element is, is becoming very interesting. Uh, the link with the microbiome for all of the digestive, um, the different microbiome that we have linking with the sun gel and another element like that. So it's mm -hmm. uh, it started back then. And as Robbie was saying, it's very interesting when we have that perspective to see how it evolved and see where we're at now, because Western science also evolved and improved. So within the different era, the way that things were said were based on the information that they had available. So now we can upgrade and improve um, one of the, common mistake associated that we can see is the notion of qi being oxygen, uh, which doesn't really work because oxygen needs blood to circulate. So it, it's not a gas anymore once it's in the body, uh, whereas gasotransmitter are gases circulating and are part of the nervous system. So there's, you know, there's argument there. Of course, it's not one-to-one -one correlation just yet, but it's going in that direction, which is very interesting. Excellent.
that's a good place to end the whole the whole thing come on <laughs> um thank you fabrice um uh Jin Jing. okay so muscle tendon change classic um so the Yi Jin Jing, I started when I first learned from my Sifu, Alex Ko. Uh, he taught us the Da uh, Jin which seems to be an earlier version of the Yi Jin Jing. Uh, both, are, who knows, both are attributed to Damo or Bodhidharma, you know, both attributed to Shaolin. <laughs> uh, this particular one, uh, the Da Jin Fa, again, 12 exercises, they're saying that we, it, it it's, almost a precursor to our uh, three battles former or San Chen. Uh, and because the San Chen comes from the, what they call the uh, Tat Chun or Dat Zun, respecting boxing, one of the five ancestor styles that makes up the five ancestor fist. And therefore this is the, and that's all the body training, the, the Ne Gong basically um, comes from there. And the the Da Jin Fa basically is 12 exercises. It's basically a Jan Duong posture or standing pole posture. And you're tensing different parts of like your wrists. Uh, you're making clamps and you're with your thumb and pulling back. You're pressing. You have your arms to the side and you're pressing out. But you're holding the posture and pressing against. So it's an isometric exercise for the part of the arms that you're moving. But you're also focusing the breath and the intra-abdominal pressure and the uh, tilting of the pelvis or not, depending on the structure that you're, the, the, the posture of the arms, right? Uh, and so there's, a, and a clear mind, so there's a meditative piece, it's a mind-body piece, it's a standing pole piece, uh, it's circulating the chi through the microcosmic orbit as you're strengthening through isometrics, backward, forward, sideways, out to the side, up and down, etc. Very specific. And then the Yi Jin Jing later that they call um, the Shaolin Yi Jin Jing, where we see all those line drawings that are repeated in all the Chinese books and in some English in Robert Smith's Secrets of Chinese Boxing book uh, is a system of Qigong that went a little further because they're adding uh, it's uh, isotonic movement, right? So you're having tension under movement in your body. You're holding pressure under movement and you're getting into different postures and poses that are relevant for Kung Fu, for that kind of Kung Fu, say Northern Shaolin or something. Um, and so you're both um, using strength, you're using tension, you're using isotonics, you're moving, and then you're holding a pose to develop your strength, you know, in, in that area. Uh, and then there's 12 postures that go with that. Um, and, and that one is less or, or almost no meditation involved in it. You're not doing the standing pole training anymore. Now it's postural training. You're moving just to get to the end point or from the end point of one to the end point of the next to hold. Right. So you're not do one, stand back up, do another one, stand back up. It's continuing through a flow, but you're you're strengthening your body through the flow. You're holding for however many breaths you're going to hold uh, or seconds in that pose. Then you have to move and stretch and tense different. So you're tensing and stretching at the same time. Uh, that's kind of like today we have this thing called PNF or proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. It's a type of stretching where you press. In osteopathic medicine, they just call it MET, muscle energy technique. A lot easier to say. Where you say you get in a butterfly stretch with your feet together and your knees out to the side, and you put your hands on your knees and you press your knees up against your hands and you hold and don't move until you fatigue, and then you relax your knees, and then your hands can press your knees down further because you fatigued out the antagonistic muscle that's keeping the other muscle from relaxing out, right? Or from, from moving. So it's a type of stretching based on fatiguing the antagonistic piece. And basically, Yi Jin Jing, the Shaolin Yi Jin Jing that moves is you're tensing the muscles in this direction, but because you're also moving, you're stretching muscles in the other direction. So it's like a strength training while you're stretching rather than just stretching and being loose without the strength. So it's a pretty ingenious set of exercises developed for a more rigorous martial art and no, martial arts with more movements. Like the Northern styles have longer stances and postures more separated arms than the Southern, most of the Southern do, not Choi Li Fudd or Hungar, but most of the other Southern styles do. So I think um, the influence has, has been, you know, quite, I think Iron Wire set from Hungar would, would probably say to have come out of that, although I'm just hypothesizing our Sam Chen comes from that for sure, uh, which then means it makes it all its way to Okinawa, you know, and to Japan uh, as well. So. Right on. 
Yeah, I think, you know, Yi Jin Jing, it's, it's, it's really fascinating because Yi Jin Jing and a couple of other styles of, of old school, you know, Qigong, Daoyan, whatever, um, are are often sort of like the foundation, actually, for a lot of modern Qigong styles. So you'll see Yi Jin Jing and everything. You see Bad Wan Jin, it, it Silk Brocades and everything. And you see Wu Qin Shi, um, the five animal frolics in, in everything. And then also the sounds, of course, but six healing sounds in the the old the old school version didn't doesn't have any movements. It's just it's just vocalization in the old texts. But um, so we can use that as a jumping off point because what we've done so far is we've we've talked about history a lot. And but Mark has mentioned some important things, which is actually practice. Right? Practice is pretty important. And so moving into our sort of contemporary Qigong world we're in a really interesting position. I don't think it's a predicament necessarily, but it's a complex position. And the complex position looks something like um, everybody who teach, if you put 100 Qigong people in a room, you'd have 160 opinions about Qigong. And that really, um, I think, is a unique situation because it gives us a chance to improve because there's a lot of ideas out there, but at the same time, boy, is it ever confusing. So if we had to talk to people who want to study Qigong and get good at it, and let's just make it simple. Let's say that they just want to be more healthy, but they want to do it as optimally as possible. Then in the current environment, which is very uh, confusing because everybody has their different soul blocks, let's say, how do you, how would you as a new student, an informed new student, make progress in Qigong. And let's start with, with Fabrice. That's a very good question. Um, well, first thing would be to find a teacher, I guess. Uh, and that fortunately, and especially with how things went with the pandemic, a lot of people now have relatively good quality online information. Um, to start with, <laughs> Could you go with just something as simple as YouTube video? Uh, if your intent is just to start to move and do something, sure, you can you can get some stuff. And there's some form that are easier to approach and to start with. And some people that have good um, teaching abilities that made simple tutorial that you can go around and play with. And that gives you access to a Qigong teacher uh, up to a certain limit, even if there's none in your area. I would say with that, if you really want to get better result, getting feedback from a teacher is essential. Um, not everyone who has online video is necessarily a good online teacher, but some people have been doing it enough that even through seeing you um, as an image through a camera, they can give you some tip to help you improve what you're doing. Uh, and if you get somebody that's skilled in chi emission, distance healing, and all of that, you kind of get the bonus of having the effect of chi that you can work with, even if you're not in the same room. Um, if not just being in a group, you get the bonus of the group and the teacher and the ability of the teacher to kind of correct you in some structural aspect. Um, and generally speaking, paying attention to your structure, making sure you don't, you know, overdo movement that you can or can't do, that you respect some element, respect your breathing, and just learn to quiet your mind, you'll kind of get, you know, you'll, you'll get a good mileage already with just that, if we're talking about purely beginner, uh, and I would say beginner to intermediate level, uh, that may be more than sufficient. Brilliant. So I'm going to I'm going to reframe the question for Mark so that we can get we, well, I don't know what Mark's going to say, but I'm going to reframe it anyway. Um, so let's say that um, let's say that now that you're stu you studied for a while, you've taken Fabrice's excellent advice and you've studied for a while and you have your foot in the door. You got a basic idea about one system or two systems, let's say. But then the next thing you notice is that when you're looking at online content and you're reading books, there's all these different claims and the claims are some people, you know, say that you can do this and you'll be able to get over every illness that you've ever had. And other people say that, you know, you can learn to work with your own personal little pet demon and train them how to go out and, um, you know, um, get you things. And, uh, and there's all these different claims in the Qigong world. And it's very confusing because, you know, you're, you're still, 
you're knowledgeable now, but you're confronted with all of these different ideas and uh, and and you don't know what to make of them. So how do we how do we navigate this really complex world of um, often conflicting information and claims and all this kind of stuff? Yeah, that's you hit it. You hit the nail on the head. I mean, you just want a system that promises levitation and longevity for you know at least two three hundred years, and just follow the teacher. I mean, I don't understand the the, the question. Is it more <laughs> or, very bad? Very bad. Or, yeah, uh, I think we have a lot of smart, educated people today, or at least if they're not smart and educated, they've been exposed to a lot of content, right? There's just, you just put in Qigong in YouTube and forget it. I mean, you could watch free Qigong until you're 97 uh, and never, there will be more and more and more and more videos. And you'd see 700 versions of Bad Wan Jin or 900 versions of this, you know? Um, and the problem is it gets overwhelming, like what's right, what's wrong, this and that. So I think if somebody was really interested, they would just look at, I think this is my advice is that they should study the, if they're, if they're not in an area where there's a teacher to get you started in person, which would be best, even if the teacher's not really good, you'll find that out because you're going to be looking at YouTube and reading articles and books and other videos. And eventually you'll be like, well, these four books on this say this and teacher doesn't doing that. And you know, who knows, you, you'll move on as we all do. But the basic essence of Qigong, I, I think is like if we apply a six gate theory, right? Front, back, left, right, up, down, right? And then you know that the yi leads the chi, right? So it's like mind intention and movement and they all have to be synchronized, right? So as long as you're moving at a slow enough speed that you're not moving faster than the chi is moving or the chi can move the blood, then, and if your mind is really centered and focused or you're practicing toward that, so your intention and the movement and the breath start and stop at the same time, start and stop at the same time. And you're going, you know, splitting together in, in, in all six directions. I think that's a good Qigong system, you know, and then until you find a teacher, but really I feel like that's the essence of a basics basis of a, of a, of a, a decent Qigong system, whether or not, you know, they all, they all don't have to do all of that, but, and I think a student can start with that and you know find a teacher you, you're definitely going to need a teacher at some point who can watch your breathing you know who can watch if you're raising your chest and you have all the energy is top heavy you know if you're sinking enough if you're rooted if they can feel the energy moving they can help stimulate it whatever you, you definitely need a teacher but i think you can get the rudiments just by following the basic what is qigong you know mind breath movement and we have six directions and Hands, hands and arms and legs move together or, or move separately. And um, I think start with that and then really try to find a teacher. So you guys heard it here first. Um, I didn't hear anything about Pokemon training at any point. Well, so, that's that might be your teacher, your Poke trainer. <laughs> yeah, if you were if you were looking for um, demon training Qigong, this is not yeah. the, uh, this is not the Zoom call uh, podcast to find it. Um, uh, but one more thing is that yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. Um, I love Pokemon, but if you want to study Qigong, don't study martial art Qigong or Tai Chi Qigong or Tai Chi and think it's Qigong, like study Qigong, right? If you just want to learn Qigong, learn actual Qigong system rather than having it being a section of a system where a lot of your time is taken up learning the Tai Chi form, the movements, the postures, it takes a long time or a Kung Fu system to get to the Qigong or Heigong part part of it. So if you just want Qigong, just really go and find Qigong. Fantastic. And I just want to adjust controversies here. Um, so just so everybody knows, uh, Taiji Qigong Shabasher is uh, is a Qigong system that's influenced by Taiji movements. So I just wanted to put that out in the open there so there's no confusion. Um, so now we, we've talked about the past and we've we've looked at some of the things that would happen for people now, right? You want to figure out how to study. It's not that hard, actually. Um, you know, we it's better if we can find a teacher. It's great if they're quite qualified. Uh, but even if you can't, you can learn a relatively easy Qigong system from, from the internet or you can go to an online school. Um, 
eight silk brocades is is one of the easiest ones um and you can go from there and and you know you don't have to you don't have to put too much stock in in all of the claims because the, the, that that's um that's a difficult um pond to swim through until you really have a, a foundation under you but now um since we've we've covered you know how we got here kind of and where we're standing now um i'd like to also talk a little bit about the future right so qigong in the north american world and the occident it has a future and um we have a really interesting demographic situation in the whole world right now basically there's a couple countries that don't have this situation but most of the developed countries of the world have this pretty similar demographic situation which is that we're not at replacement level uh, population and so basically what that means is we're going to have an increasingly elderly population um with with less of a social support network in general because of the relative lack of younger people. And uh, in Chinese medicine right now, this is considered to be a sign that probably Chinese medicine is going to see a great increase in popularity over the next 20 years or so because it because it's one of the things that's good it, chinese medicine is good at dealing with a lot of problems that happen to people as they get older but qigong is also very good at dealing with problems as people get older and so as we uh hurdle uh terrifyingly into the future um i'm wondering about both of your takes on not just on the demographic issue but kind of like where you see qigong going let's say first in a positive direction, but then maybe you can also tell me about your potential negative direction um, and, uh, and and roll those into the same comment. And uh, I don't want to say who should speak first. So um, why don't you guys play rock, paper, I last. There we it's go. just ping pong. Excellent. Sounds good. Um, I think it's, it's definitely going to be a great tool for, you know, we've seen it in China, how it's been used for the aging population. Um, the word Qigong in the West is not as known as yoga or even Tai Chi, but those who hear about Qigong usually refer it also a little bit more like Tai Chi to exercise for older people. Uh, I don't agree with that idea, but it does. it is a part of it, definitely. Um, and before I moved to Mexico, when I was living full time still in Canada, I was teaching in, in retirement home and the quality of life that it gave to some of the students that I had were between their 80s and 90s and sometime mid 90s uh, was amazing. Uh, one lady who was my oldest student at the time was 92 or 93 came up to me and say, you know, since I've been taking those classes with you for the past year, I don't need to use my inhaler anymore. And she used to use it multiple times a day. And I mean, her Qigong was, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just moving how I can. It wasn't great Qigong in any way, but it was more than enough for her to gain health benefits from her practice. Um, and so this is also something that on the broader perspective is important for us to keep in mind. Um, I don't know about you, Mark, but for myself for a while, uh, especially when I was a bit younger and learning it and being eager to, you know, dive in the deep of it and go as far as I could, anything that wasn't bringing me the depth that I was looking for is like, oh, that's not good Qigong enough. That's, that's not good <laughs> enough. Let's, let's really get the good and the, the meat and the potatoes and the greedy stuff and get everything that we can. And we need to teach all of it to everyone because otherwise it's not going to be good. But that's not the case. We don't need to be as lunatic as I was on that aspect. Um, simple things, simple movements are beneficial. And our society, modern society, especially in the West, is so sedentary that something as simple as, you know, taking a few Tai Chi steps, taking a few breathe, just breathe deeper, be aware of how you're breathing. Very simple things can make big difference for people in their health and their daily life. Um, and so within also the discussion of, you know, find a teacher and all of that that we have, not every teacher need to be university level, you know, as deep as Robbie is for understanding the history and placing thing into context or as Mark is with, with his background as well, um, in order to be a good teacher. I mean, we need kindergarten and, and elementary school teacher, because if we don't have them, then 
the kids won't get to the university. They won't even have the bases that they need to go there. And there's usually less universities and less teacher in those universities than there are people for elementary level. And we need that. Um, so what we see now, I think having a strong basis of good quality entry level teacher is much more important than trying to have, you know, a gazillion high level teacher who get bored if they try to teach two elementary stuff as well. So we need that balance and, and seeing how people can bring good health to their student that are coming uh, with very simple thing is, is I think essential. That's really where it's going to have the most positive support for the aging population in the West. Uh, and in a certain perspective, the role of a teacher is to help kind of point out your, your blind spot. So even if the teacher is not the greatest, if it's able to see what you need to do to improve, then it's doing its job and it's helping you, which is the most important as a student to get someone who has your back and helps you improve in what you're doing, along with giving you information you don't necessarily have access to. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I'm, I'm going to just jump in and, and start by saying you and I had a very different inner psycho psychological experience with our our training early on because you're like oh i did this practice it doesn't work throw it away and move on and get the ah, powerful i'm gonna you know master everything and i was like oh this one doesn't work i suck so bad because i can't do it it has to work or they wouldn't have written about it in in a book and some teacher wouldn't be promoting it and, and why can't i get chi shooting out of all five fingers on both hands you know and i would just beat myself up over it of, of how bad of a student i was reading from books or videos or learning from people. Be, and maybe that's why I had chronic pain and just <laughs> can't internalize all the failures, but it's, you know, you're right. It's the bad system. Just because it's out there doesn't make it a good system. Um, <laughs> just, just a funny contrast in the way we thought about things. Um, um, I think the future holds, I think the elderly population, the gerontology, as we call it here in the States, uh, the, is, is the, one of the key key audiences for qigong you know uh, you have the practices where they can stand or do tai chi walking or do you know standing or moving qigong and then you have seated practices and you have practices for those lying in bed who are bedridden and the results seem to be equally as good uh you know the person lying down doesn't need the mobility they're not going to get it maybe but they can still get the benefit of of mental tranquility, the blood moving, the chi moving, feeling invigorated, right? And maybe eventually they can stand and, and walk, but there's qigong for lying, sitting and standing still and standing and moving. You know, it's a, quite a robust um, curriculum, I guess we could say, that is available within the practice. And once you have the concept as a good teacher, you can apply it to someone who needs a walker and they have to hold on and someone who's in a wheelchair. I mean, it, the applications are endless uh, in that in that regard, I think some of the some of the potential pitfalls. Oh, and I also think in sports and as part of sports uh, sports medicine, they should be having some kind of qigong practices and nagong practices, and you know, soccer, football, uh, baseball, whatever. Because I think, and and also in orchestra, you know, they're using their fingers with the violin and getting tendonitis and all kinds of qi ball exercises and you know, nagong exercises could really help with that if someone knew how to kind of parlay that in and could create a program that sp speaks their jargon, you know. I think some of the pitfalls is that we're in a, we're in a, with social media um, being as big as it is and everybody being their own brand. We have a problem with branding and marketing now where everybody's an expert. And there are some experts in the meditative uh, slash uh, consciousness field who are huge, I mean, pillars who know almost nothing, but they keep building their reputation on more books, changing, changing the keyword of their method. You know, this time it's integrated this, the next time it's radical this because they want to sell more programs, but they're really, there's no change in the content because they don't know anymore, but they keep marketing it out and writing more books. And the same in Kung Fu, there's, and karate and martial arts, there's a lot of books out by a same authors written many books, several of them, and they're just horrible, but people don't know, you know, one of the biggest martial art YouTube channels, with millions of viewers on it, the, the gentleman is horrific, just doesn't know anything, but he looks athletic and good and 
makes a good video and you know but the content is just horrible so the the pitfall is that because of that the marketing and branding there's no gatekeeper on the information right and anybody can watch your channel and you can suck them into your to your cult right <laughs> to your brand uh but the good news is that there's so much available that more and more people will know about it and the people who are good can go out and say hey let's get this in elementary school, it can help ADHD, you know, like uh, the NADON, right? To help the kids just focus and meditate, quiet down. Uh, it can help with sports. It can help in the senior homes. It can help in rehab with physical therapy. Uh, and part of all Ch Chinese medicine, you know, when I was in practice, it was, you know, herbs, qigong, twina, and acupuncture, you know, and you do it all together. Uh, and you give people things to do in in a once a week at the clinic and do it at home. And if they don't, they don't, but you do your best, you do the best you can for them. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity. It's, it's hard fighting. It's hard, not fighting. It's hard gaining a spotlight in a very crowded field when there's no filter. You don't have to find a publisher who says your what you wrote is good. It's well thought out. The thought, the program is structured. The book is well written. The photographs are good. It's going to teach you or your video. And you can just throw it out there and just people stop buying, buying them because there's so much garbage. Um, but more and more people are learning about it and it's, they can see over time, the difference between the good and the bad. So, and you, you can't prevent it. You can't prevent, you know, there's a saying in cooking that to the, uh, something like to the top come floats the riches and the spoils when you're making a soup base or broth. You get all that foam at the top and the fat. And some of that's the spices and the herbs and the oil. And the other stuff is just like the junk in the in the fruit or vegetables or dirt or bone marrow that you don't want that floats to the top. So both the riches and the spoils come up and you try and scoop away the bad. Nice. Both of you hit it out of the park with your answers, by the way. These were just really like powerhouse answers in Qigong. Um and uh, so, so for Fabrice, I really like the idea that you have to have actually teachers in every level. Um, it's it it would be crazy. And this is one of the things. And I think I'm going to try to synthesize both of your answers here because Mark also touched on something very important, which is that these days, because of the the power of your cell phone, um, you know, and and the and the fact that marketing is is really becoming a, a well understood technique by a lot of people. So it ends up being the case that you have people maybe who are not such good uh, Qigong teachers, but they they have excellent marketing backgrounds. Um, I used to work in the tea industry and there's um, there's a local tea company in, uh, in Toronto where they have the most atrocious tea. You just can't believe how bad it is, but both of the owners have MBAs. And uh, so they're, they're in every grocery store now. Um, but uh, anyway, my my um, my jealousy of their success aside, um, I want to okay. synthesize your two answers a little a little bit because I think that um, what what Fabrice mentioned about the idea that you need to have a kindergarten teacher, you need to have a grade school teacher, you need to have somebody who's like you know high school or university level, um, and for those very few people that want to go beyond that, then there's got to be something beyond that. Um, and then at the same time, um, Mark's comment that there's no there's no gatekeeper for this, and it's almost impossible. There's a trend. There's two trends I see, and the two trends both kind of enervate me. Um, one of them is that you have people who are actually quite good at practice, but their their stories are, um, let's say, quite imaginative. And, and the places that they go with their practices, you know, relative to they're, they're, they're quite flexible about the truth, let's say. And so you get a lot of, you get a lot of um, confusion that happens in the community. And this happens to me quite frequently is I'll have people send my, I'm, my area of interest is mainly in, in Taoist meditation. That's basically what I do. And I get people who send me emails quite, quite often that are the most wonderfully confused emails you know, and I almost can't make sense of them, but I understand it's the current language that's used in the genre. It's very, very difficult to to answer because I don't want to say bad things about, you know, people who are just trying to do their best. But at the same time, that, that confusion really makes it impossible for most people to study. Uh, at the same time, though, you have this other situation where there's a, a professional class who don't have 
an attitude that's as good as your attitude, Fabrice, or as good as your attitude, Mark, where they have this sort of idea. Um, I think they might be a little influenced by Plato's idea of the philosopher kings, you know, where you sort of have a, a society that's governed by uh, these this technocratic philosophy class who gets to, you know, decide what the what what the uh, standards are and in the qigong world and in the in the taoism world which i occupy there's a lot of extreme gatekeeping at at the middle and top level where people they just can't stand the the confusion that goes on and so they become really you know pretty new with it and uh and and i think that both of those problems are kind of the wrong take like we should be we should just try to nurture a good community and get out there with what, what we think is good information, recognize the fact that we don't know everything um, and, uh, and, and do our best, just like our moms always told us to do. And, uh, you know, if, if you do that, then you, you bring beauty and light to the community. Right. So I, I was really happy to hear both of your, both of your answers because they were, they were different, but they were in harmony with each other. And, and you could see that if you were to, if you were to create a synthesis of those two ideas, you could move in a in a great direction. Um, so I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up, but I want to give you both the opportunity to to get a last word in. But the last word, I mean, typically what we do here, um, Dawi is is an organization which is dedicated to promotion of um, what we call the Taoist arts. But you know, broadly speaking, uh, Qigong, the internal martial arts, Taoist cultivation, Chinese medicine, or even arts and culture. And and what we like to do with the the promotional idea in mind is to give you both a chance to you know tell us about what you're doing because both of you have fascinating projects and so um, I'm sure our audience would love to check out your websites and you know dig in a little bit deeper even um, so why don't we uh, why don't we start with uh, you Mark you, you have an awesome podcast you have a publishing company it's just endless endless awesomeness so so can you tell us about what what you're doing and where to find you. Well, I'm just, you know, putting out endless awesomeness every day and bringing joy to the world. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, podcast is called Transformations with Mark V. Wiley, because there are several Transformations podcasts. So put the whole name in, you'll get it. Um, Google, Spotify, Amazon, it's, it's, it's everywhere where uh, you want to see it. And YouTube is the video. All the audios are on the podcast apps. We've had Rob on and a lot of other great people. It's not just about um, meditation or Qigong or martial arts, although that's probably more than 50%. It's also about um, uh, spiritual practices and really finding the transformative nature of human experience. Uh, so we've had military, I've had military people on and meditators and Kundalini teachers and people who do, you know, uh, deep sea diving and uh, mountain climbing and all delving into the, into that transformative nature of experience and consciousness. Um, Tambulimedia.com, T-A-M-B-U-L-I. Um, basically martial arts, meditation, and wellness books, articles, some videos, go there and check them out. A lot of ton of free content on the site. You can find internal elixir cultivation, Robert J James Coons's book uh, on that site. Um, I'm finishing a few more, uh, screenplays, uh, heading hopefully toward production. Um, and, um, what else am I doing? Oh, on April 12, I will be publishing a Kung Fu book called Gol Cho Kun or Five Answers to Fist, Inner Teachings, all on the deeper inner teachings of the art, the body mechanics, the power engine, uh, the energy, make on work. Um, on the death anniversary of my Sifu, Alex Ko, April 12. And I just got a forward in from the Grandmaster in China, who was listed as an inheritor of the style. And he wrote me a nice uh, preface uh, for the book. So that will be out on April 12th. Uh, epic. Wonderful. So you know where to find Mark. And there's there's many places. And and, and Mark mentioned the screenplays. And he, he has made a movie, which is which is tremendous. Do you mind telling us the name? made in chinatown and it's made like you're a made guy in the mafia chinese kid joins the mob to try and get an italian girlfriend starts a fight between the triad and the mafia uh has to save the day <laughs> to get the girl um 
that's on all the streaming platforms. You can see it free to be in Pluto and Amazon and Freebie and all the other places. Um, I produced a couple of six or seven other films, but I wrote that one and these two new ones. One's a musical and one is a full throttle action film about a lady assassin who gets her knives and takes revenge. So, so made made in Chinatown is an excellent movie. By the way, I, I've I've seen yeah. it. It is it is very funny. Um. So and and Fabrice. So I want to give you a chance. I I've seen you in action in person. Um. We I, I brought uh, Fabrice was was living in Toronto for a while and and uh, he had he gave a seminar at uh, Eight Branches uh, Chinese Medicine College, um. And uh, it was incredibly fun and interesting to to see Fabrice's energy as a teacher. Um, he's a very he's a very detail-oriented person and a very patient person and and also a very warm and inclusive person. And yes. so I know that many people in the Chinese medicine community, by the way, many professionals who who you know if you were to go to colleges, they might be your teacher. Uh, they they're studying um, in in Fabrice's long program, so I can say that he gets a really really good endorsement um, from many many professionals who I respect a lot. So I would also like to give you a chance to to promote what you're doing. Thank you, Robbie. Um, yeah, so my my main thing is really teaching Tai Chi Qigong Shabashar as far as the public who's watching that may be interested. Um, Qigong 18, so Q-I-G-O-N-G, number one and eight dot com uh, is just kind of the publicity. It's a bit outdated. I need to redo that. Um, for the online courses, people can look at it at Qigong 18 dot online. Um, that's usually where I uh, announce my teacher training that I offer. So I, I've been teaching Qigong online actually since 2012. So even pre a few years pre pandemic and, you know, getting news on how do I see people and having the opportunity to teach people online and then see them in person and notice how my understanding of what they were doing was good. I was like, okay, this, and that was mostly one-on-one -on -one for a few years, uh, which led me to decide to do group teaching as well for that. So the feedback is really where the key of having a teacher is. Um, so as we work together, um, teaching online that way, uh, the last few years have been focusing a lot on teaching acupuncturists and bringing more the the medical side of the Tai Chi Qigong Shabash system. Uh, it's one of the most popular Qigong system out there. There's millions of people doing it, but because Professor Lin never really taught it, in depth, uh, it's it's everybody's doing it in their own version, kind of, because the information at the root was not there. Having studied privately with Professor Lin uh, for more than ten years now, uh, gave me the opportunity to really understand the system as a system rather than just a form and a choreography, and sharing that with my understanding of physiology, anatomy, Chinese medicine, osteopathy, and all of that really. Basically, the more I learn from the medical field, the more I discover that, oh, that was already there in the practice that I was doing. So it's it's beautiful to see uh, the richness of and the simplicity and the synergy of everything that Professor Lin put together. So sharing that system has been the, my main focus um, for the past 10, 12, 12-ish years now. Um, yeah, so it's a pleasure. I'm in the process of writing a book. I have a, a student who's a writer, so we're working on that to try to help bring the depth of that knowledge out there uh, so it can be more at least available because um, as you've seen, Professor Lin's book have very interesting information, but there's only one that was translated into English and it's out of print for so long that bringing this level of knowledge that wasn't published anywhere will, will be interesting to share. And my goal is really for the information to be available so that people can have access to it and then they can do whatever they want with it. But at least the information is there versus until now, that information is almost unavailable beside Francesco and myself who started to to make some of that information more out. Yeah. So. Excellent. Okay, well, this is good. So you guys know where to find these two uh, lovely people. And, uh, and so uh, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, I'm going to wrap it down. Please, guys, just stay on the call for a minute after I turn off the recording. Um, so you... 
round table. Um, we have a, a, a clearly a very interesting uh, and diverse Qigong community going on. There's a lot of different ideas out there. And um, today you have, uh, you've heard at least our, our takes on it. Um, and uh, it's our intention to keep bringing you these, uh, these interesting uh, round table talks, as well as our, our regular uh, expert series podcast, where we interview uh, people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you may or may not know that we have a interview with uh, Mark Wiley already available to view. Um, been a very popular one and it's very good and F Fabrice we got to get you on the show so you know let's let's talk about that um and uh and we'll we'll hopefully see each other again soon <laughs>